Welcome to another Splatoon 2 video on the channel. Last week one of the devs did an interview with Famitsu and pretty much he gave out new details about the lore of the game. So what we'll do is cover those details in this video. He also gave out some interesting stats about the game which I will talk about in the next video. But this Famitsu interview was translated last week by the people over on the Splatoon Reddit, so just like to give a shout out to them. So yeah, let's just pretty much go through the new details that we've learned about the lore behind Splatoon 2. So there was a little bit of confusion about this, but people first thought that this interview did confirm that Marina can't super jump, but it seems like that she doesn't super jump based on the fact that she has to carry all of her DJ gear around. So pretty much Nagame, who was the dev that got interviewed, was asked if Inklings super jump to maps that are geographically farther away, how does Marina travel to these places? The initial answer was that she goes by train. The dev then later said that she has a lot of DJ gear to get around and to move to different places. So the question made it seem like that she can't super jump, but at this stage, it is unclear whether she can't super jump or whether she doesn't super jump based on the fact that she's got a lot of stuff to you know, carry around and she can't super jump with that DJ gear. Hopefully, we will get clarification of that in the future in you know other interviews hopefully this Famitsu interview gets like an official translation as well it will definitely clear up this issue. Famitsu then asked why are there jellyfish spectators now in Splatoon 1 you mentioned that there weren't any spectators because ranked battles were done underground and this is how the dev answered that question. Ranked battles are itching their way towards becoming a competitive event just like freestyle skateboarding became a competitive event. So it's pretty cool how you do see the jellyfish. It's like on Gerby Arena. I find it really cool how you see them just sit around on the stage, like spectating the, you know, the match and what is going on. I just find it cool how they have added in those jellyfish within um, Splatoon 2. It definitely is a nice little touch. It's cool how they have added in some lore to this as well. I think it is cool that, you know, jellyfish... They like to watch ranked battles. Ranked battles are becoming a quite popular spectator sport. It kind of makes me think like if ranked battles were like real life, they would appear in something like the X Games. So yeah, that's just cool how they have added in some lore to the fact that they have now added in jellyfish to the stages within Splatoon 2. Famitsu then asked, there seems to be shops like the sushi place in the reef where the Inklings have turf wars and ranked battles. What do the employees think when battles are happening right in front of their stores? The Garmi answered, for the Inklings, turf wars are more than just a sport. It's like Brazil where soccer has a cultural aspect. So it is accepted in society and these workers only think, yeah, they're young, they do this. Although the owner of the sushi place may dislike it slightly, I guess it is because they are messing up his workplace. I guess that is why the sushi owner doesn't like the fact that, you know, turf wars are happening right outside of his business. The Garmin then went on to explain how turf wars came about. I guess we already knew this information from the first game. But this information is still cool nonetheless. So rather than starting as a sport, Turf Wars started from the instinctive territorial conflict of Inklings with forcibly added rules and regulations so it can't be held. By letting them have Turf Wars, it dissipates their combative spirit. Now this next piece of information is really weird. Gelfonso, one of the shop owners in Splatoon 2, he was asexually produced by Gelonzo, who was one of the clothes shop's owners within Splatoon 1. That is really weird, but I guess that does happen like naturally in real life. So it's cool how that has been reflected within the game itself. It's just weird to actually think that Gelonzo 
produced Joe Fonso. That is just really weird to think about. But like what I said, I guess this does happen in real life. Merchant Spark's hometowns were close by and Merch started to work for him after being inspired by Spark's success. Spike made enough money in Splatoon 1 that he doesn't have to work anymore, but continues to work on a laptop at the cafe. Flo was originally travelling as a working holiday and met the owner of Headspace during her travels. She was liked by the owner and started working there. She symbolises the flow of people in a populated urban city. Bisk, the owner of Shell Fresh in Splatoon 2, he was dramatic from the moment of his birth. He came to Incopoli Square from a pretty cold country, leaving his lover behind to pursue his musical career. Famitsu then asked about the lanyard on the turtle within Incopoli Square. Nagami answered saying that was a decoration used as a prop for commercials filmed in the past. But the Inklings forgot to remove it afterwards. Now this next information I find really interesting. There is a mutual relationship between Salmonoids and Octarians. Salmonoids provide eggs that can be used as energy and the Octarians provide technology, machinery and weaponry. I would love to see that relationship get featured within like a DLC sort of pack for Splatoon 2. I would love to see that relationship actually get featured within the game itself or in the next game Splatoon 3 but that is definitely interesting how Salmonoids and Octarians they have a mutual relationship so yeah I'd love to see that actually get featured within content within Splatoon 2 or if we have to wait for Splatoon 3 I'd definitely love to see that within the actual game itself. I'd love to see this relationship in the actual game. Mr. Grizz is always only heard, but is he remotely observing the workplace is the last question that I will be featuring in this video. And this is how Nagami answered it. Is he even looking? His voice may just be a programmed text to voice speech software. So yeah, that definitely does bring up some new lore that we didn't learn about before. I definitely did find this information interesting and I would love to see Nintendo go more in depth with the lore behind Splatoon. So yeah, I definitely did find this interview really interesting and like what I said, I would love to see some of this stuff, especially the relationship between Salmonoids and Octarians. I would love to see that relationship and stuff like that, like stuff that I mentioned in this video. I would love to see that sort of stuff actually get featured within the game itself it's cool that we've got some more backstory to some of these characters that are in the game but it would be cool if this information did actually get replemented in the game itself and we actually did see a representation of this law within the game itself so let me know your thoughts about this video in the comment section below let me know your thoughts about all of this new law that's pretty much it and i will see you in the next video